is flowing, let it flow. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So your next presentation is by Michael Clark, M85 MTC. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I undertook in this a uh, most interesting, and I find it a, a very valuable experience for myself to have explored something of George Dobbs and what he wrote and uh, made in the QRP world. And he was a leading light in a whole lot of ways. Uh, and um, so, George Dobbs, D3RJV, he was licensed by the time he was 20 and had the Morse code and was listening to trawlers in Grimsby and Morse code. Uh, of how lucky he is, I think to myself, because I didn't start to try and learn Morse code until I was well into my 60s. And I'll tell you something, it doesn't really work all that well. You, have, you lack that, uh, that vigor and vim of youth with something new. Uh, he was licensed in 1963. Uh, he is, I think, probably worldwide the most prolific writer uh, and author on QRP matters. He founded the G GQRP club in 1974, and that got mentioned in our previous talk. And he edited Sprat, uh, small power radio amateur transmissions, from the first edition to the 175th edition. Uh, and uh, that was over about 50 years. Now, George described himself. Oh, how do I get to this next one? Oh, it's a touch screen. That's it's not screen. Touch. It's not touch. Is that going to work? No, I just hit the space bar. Okay. Right. In one of his pieces in Shortwave magazine in March 1985, George declared of himself, I'm not a technical author. I'm a mere amateur radio entertainer. A lovely word to use. He was a very significant experimenter as well. Uh, over a half century, George published a huge range of technical and social QRP writings and talks. I use the word social because he was consciously talking to and talking within and talking to people outside a QRP community. He had did a huge amount of work to build the community that we belong to and QRP. Thousands followed him worldwide and we've had some indication of that from the previous talk. Uh, one of the things he said and uh, people remembered it so much, do something pointless every day. You don't have to be driving yourself all the time. And amateur uh, is a pastime. Have a pastime a pointless pastime and do something with it every day and make it amateur for the very love of it. That's what amateur means. His earliest writing that I could trace was in the Eagle comic. Uh, uh, there's, uh, there aren't enough of you in this uh, mature enough to remember Eagle. Uh, it was a sort of a boy's uh, comic way back in the 1940s and 50s. Very colourful, right. Oh, oh, Tony, you don't look that age. Uh, and he wrote, he had built, a, a, I suspect, a, 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 a regenerative receiver for uh, Radio Luxembourg. And he had mounted it on the carrier of his bicycle. And he was mobile on his bicycle. And he wrote a letter to Eagle Comic sometime in the 1950s. I haven't been able to trace down the actual uh, issue. I couldn't find Eagle online. He learned Morse in Scouts, and he learned his Morse also uh, from a, a, a 
another lad of about the same age as himself uh, when the two of them were working uh, together and that period after leaving school and before he moved on to what, into what ended up as one's career. Uh, and he lived not far from Grimsby, which at that time was a massively busy trawler port, uh, fishing the boats that went out up around Iceland and places like that. And they depended a great deal on radio for safety reasons, etc. He would have been doing his listenings on the trawler band. The trawler band uh, was we were in the same part of the spectrum as top band in, in amateur radio, and it was widely used uh, in uh, coastal shipping, etc., etc. Uh, shortwave magazine. He wrote an article in December 1970, was the earliest I found, and it was called Cloth Ears. You can see the dog's gift for putting an interesting name on things. And he called it the psychology of CW reception. I think we would probably use the word physiology nowadays, but the word psychology was all the rage in those days. And basically what he was saying was there are certain frequencies of which you can hear and understand it more than others. But it was an intriguing uh, bit of, public, uh, of publications. Um, uh, he wrote, he was teaching an hour a week, sorry, uh, a day a week uh, in, a, in a school. And he started off a, a radio club there and he published a couple of little booklets. They were a kind of greeny blue color and were about that width. I had a couple of them and I donated them to the book uh, said to Richard uh, at one of the QRP club, um, uh, uh, one of the QRP rallies. Um, and uh, they, uh, they were actually instructions for making simple uh, radio and electronic equipment, which he was doing in this radio club in the school. Uh, he, one of his pupils, one of the pupils, had a dad who was important. The dad was the guy who ran Lady Bird books. Lady Bird books were books targeted at children uh, who could read, and he, uh, the dad, came across what his son was at. He said, "Hey." I could, I could publish that as a book, and George gave him the stuff, wrote it all, and it ended up as a Lady Bird book uh, in 1972, making a radio transistor, and uh, making a transistor radio. And the money he made from it, he bought a HW7, and we had a picture of a HW7 in that last presentation. Later on, there was another Lady Bird book, 1979, Simple Electronics. I spent a long time until last week getting those two books confused. I always thought there was just the one, but there was actually two of them. Now, that's just a nice picture of them. Uh, at one of the, uh, uh, it was a, a gathering for QRP people at a farm uh, belonging to G3PCJ, uh, who produced uh, a run of kits, and I think it's come back into business lately. Uh, he edited Spratt from 1 to 75. He created it in the winter of 1974. He edited 175 of them up to the summer of 2018. That's about 44 years. Each one of them had that characteristic G3RJV editorial at the beginning. Each the Spratt is a, a, a remarkable document to have run so long uh, and they still have been able to have a steady flow going into it of innovative ideas from the, from, from the membership of the club. Um, there was a special memorial um, a spread at the time just after he died, in which many, many of us wrote our little piece about him. And uh, Spratt continues hugely successful in colour and uh, led up by our new chairman, Steve, uh, and he has already made uh, reference a couple of times to the really good work that Tex is doing. Tex used to do uh, um, organizing the magazine uh, in his working life. Right. 
That's a, a Sprat 35, summer of 1983. Uh, it, I'm not quite sure how well it comes up on the screen, but it, it's one of the, a picture of him in his then shed, or uh, shack, which was actually in Birmingham. Later on, when he, he developed a shack that had a famous wall up to the ceiling full of stuff uh, in, in Rochdale. Uh, and um, the Sprat DVD is available on mem uh, either as a DVD or on memory stick. Uh, I think it is the best bargain of all if you're looking, if you want to research the, the writings of jo George's writings and his QRP information. And um, every it, con it, it, it contains. Every Sprat since the 1974 one, uh, which was a crude mimeographed thing, um, up to the, uh, the, it's updated regularly, and it costs members five pounds. Uh, and uh, if you're not a GQRP member, well, pay five pounds to be a member. Of, of uh, pay your membership fee, and the and the D and and the you get the you get membership and the DVD for a sum which is a wee bit less than you would get your lunch for in this fine golf club. It's a bargain. What the way they want. They that uh, that it goes. It, it's um. It it's rich a rich source of QR projects of all sorts and shapes and sizes from 1974 onwards. There's a very interesting column that has been written by Chris, uh, G4BUE, um, uh, of, of members' news and pictures. Uh, and uh, it's quite easy to get your name into it. If you've done anything at all, you publish it. And the club sales catalogue is there. The stand is up, up here, and you can get all sorts of very interesting QRP stuff uh, from um, uh, from the club, and and of course there are those editorials. Uh, the club website is also a useful tr uh, source on the writings of George Dobbs. Um, uh, there's. On the website, there's a tribute page. There's a tribute page to George Dobbs that was started as soon after his death in 2019. A lot of interesting stuff to read about him in there. There's a link to Practical Wireless. Uh, uh, I think it was June of 2009, and it is probably the best published. Um, Story of George, of, uh, of, uh, of George Dobbs, um, and um, he pr practical wireless invented for the purpose the uh, what they called the, Q, the, the the amateur radio person of the year, and then he declared it to be George Dobbs. Practical wireless had huge success from the fact that George Dobbs wrote for them. In fact. That magazine survived, in my view, because of that, uh, and I'll come to that later on. Um, uh, there's also a download copy of that special memorial sprat that you can take a look at, and there's a link to a video of a talk that he did at my club, Locker and Amateur Radio Club. Now, uh, there's a couple of members of the club here, and they will remember how much bother we had at uh, videoing that particular uh, talk. We had bother with the technology and one thing and another. Uh, and uh, he, uh, and it, it, we converted it into a, a video presentation, uh, which uh, in which he went. He called it uh, QRP, why and how, and he talked us through. A range of the of the kits and rigs that he had designed and presented over the years. It's a, it's a nice video, but the copy that's on the QRP on, on the GQRP website uh, is off. Um, uh, uh, 
um, on the web. It, it has, uh, it is, it's off YouTube. And basically what had happened, somebody spotted that the original video was put on the website of the, uh, of the amateur TV club. And it, re it was there for quite a while. But uh, that copy was taken, and any reference to its sources was taken out of it, lifted off it, and it was planted up, and, uh, and, uh, and now uh, it's on the, on the club website. But it's, 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 it's nice on it to hear his voice and his gentle but interesting flow through, uh, etc. It's a one that's worth watching. And as I put it here, see and hear what we all loved about George. Sprat 35. George wrote a lot in Radcom uh, and in fact became a major contributor to Radcom over a number of years. Sprat 35 had a little bit in this column where he, he urged folk, look out for my new QRP news column in Radcom, August 1983. And sure enough, in August 1983, he got nearly a third of a page. Uh, and about just news and so forth to do with QRP. And almost every month, there were one or two missing. <coughs> the large majority of his pages in Radcom were a full page. Uh, they were labeled QRP at the top. They had something topical, uh, some topical photograph or picture, and lots of chat about QRP news, about technical things, about projects and about people and in many many ways that was George talking about people and the things that they did. His final Radcom QRP page was in February of 2016. So over 150 Radcom QRP pages in about 33 years. That's one fantastic thing to have done in terms of productivity and quantity. Uh, those pages unfortunately aren't collated together. Uh, we'll come to another uh, an example of that later. Uh, but they make a very valuable uh, historical resource if one wanted to try and put uh, a QRP into an historical context, more or less month by month over those three, 33 very, uh, the, the, those uh, um, years. Um, the main source and the only source to get to those is the actual Radcom magazines, either on paper or uh, Radcom produces CDs of their magazines in groups by year uh, or several years together, that kind of thing. And you have to go into the whole magazine to find the columns. But that he made there a huge contribution uh, to our knowledge and, and to current affairs and it was all an, an actual uh, uh, example of his writings. Now I want to pause for a minute and have a look at these amateur radio magazines. Amateur radio magazines, they're a commercial product. They make a profit or they die. Uh, it's not like Sprat, that we get a Sprat anyhow and we enjoy doing it. Sprat in that sense is not a commercial magazine. It is vital for them to attract and to retain readership. Now, I think any of us who've been around for a while will know that there have been a lot of amateur radio magazines that have disappeared. Shortwave magazine has disappeared, for example. He, he did a lot of writing in it. Uh, and others, uh, there was a, a very interesting one that lasted only about five years called Amateur Radio. And had a lot of it had it was good for quite lengthy major uh, amateur radio pro, uh, projects in it, but it was too narrow in its in its uh, in its interest and and uh, and it didn't get the readership. It didn't make a profit. It died. Uh, now, if what you want, if you're publishing individual articles here and there and news. Uh, they're, they're useful. But remember, if you're working with a monthly magazine, you're putting it together a month, two months, or even three months before. And uh, 
news doesn't last three months before you publish it. Um, and uh, the individual articles, they're there for that issue, but not for another. Um, it's much more useful if you can get a series of articles spread out over several or over many issues. And I, I mentioned one example because I have it all together here. Uh, when they um, published about the PW7, which was one of his transceivers, it, was, it ran over several issues of, of um, Shortwave magazine. Some people only came across it at the second issue. Oh, I have to get, and they would go and try to buy the previous one, etc., etc. So, but basically, what made, what caught the interest, and held on to it, if you saw something, oh, I'd like to build that. And the first, if we are where you start, right? And you bought the next issue to get the next part of the project, and you bought the one after that to get that as well. And basically, it's much more useful to the publisher to have a series of articles. And throughout his writings, George kept making up names for series. Carrying on the practical way was one of them. It started off doing things the practical way, and then carry on, etc., etc. Um, his series uh, and his style in deal delivering those series were very profitable uh, uh, products for a magazine to have. And they were particularly useful uh, not only to Radcom but to Practical Wireless. I think his Sunday sermons are probably every bit as good. Now, if you are trying to get past issues, there's a website called worldradiohistory.com and it has an enormous collection of scanned radio publications of all kinds of radio. And it includes many amateur radio magazines. Uh, it includes uh, 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 Practical Wireless, but Practical Wireless only up to 1999. Now, they, um, there are, it's published in America, uh, but copyright in the UK has a different approach. And uh, basically, there was a bit of a row of some kind, I'm not sure the detail of it, but basically those earlier magazines, uh, you don't, Practical Wireless only goes up to 1999, uh, Shortwave Magazine only goes up to 1999, etc. Uh, in other words, the UK magazines, um, he, he, the world history doesn't have them. But there are other sources for the one since. Uh, one, one at, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever come across, Radio Constructor, uh, which ran from 1947 to 1981, and it was an endless collection of uh, broadcast radios. Uh, there was a time when, uh, you know, People bought expensive radios, but there was equally when it was much fun to build one for yourself. And if you were a teenager, you built a radio for yourself to listen to uh, 208 Radio Luxembourg and, and the like. Shortwave magazine is there up to 1999. It's based in the, in the US, and as I said, there are copyright issues with the UK. No, but it's uh, you can get buried in it. it uh, it's, it's, it's a lovely site. And I used it a lot for shortwave magazine following through George's writings. Now, uh, I am going to deal with George and Practical Wireless first, because in some ways it's easiest. Uh, Practical Wireless have produced a major DVD carrying on the practical way. It contains, it actually advertises itself as 20 years of products because they, they went on using the heading, carrying on the practical way. That was their copyright. They went on using the heading, and after George had withdrawn from it, from writing those articles, uh, other people uh, wrote similar articles under that heading. So the DVD uh, is, uh, is advertised at 19. The first I, I, carrying out the first article in pra carrying on the practical way was in August of '94 about regenerative receivers. The last one 
in August 2019 was about coil winding. And they are all uh, very interesting, well written, simple, straightforward descriptions of a lot of things very useful to us on amateur radio and in QRP amateur radio. It's a huge resource. Uh, you can still get that. Um, uh, you can still get that. Um, uh, you can still can get the DVD today. Uh, in the current practical wireless, uh, GZOTMT is, is doing a transceiver project, and he uses. He's going to use in the next issue. Uh, G, uh, George's TR box. You know the. A little uh, the, the, that part of the circuit that switches from the transmitter to the receiver and back again, uh, and he's taking it from carrying on the practical way of May 2007. So it's still it's still there and it's still in use. Um, the if you go online to the radio enthusiast a radio enthusiast website, uh, which is used to be the practical wireless one. And if you look in DVD specials, you can fi find it there and uh, it can be purchased. Now, it looks expensive, but I assure you it is well worth the money. Uh, it, 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 you have in your face, you have in that a, 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 a really big, a large part of George's very considerable contribution. Shortwave magazine uh, and um, in now, it's interesting, um, the last presenter mentioned an advert in Shortwave magazine, which I must have missed. What I did find in my researches was that in October 74, George Dobbs was in discussion with uh, E.P. Essary, G3KFE. He did this column in every edition of Shortwave magazine then, and it was the general chat and talk column and um, uh, uh, about... Um, about and basically they talked together about founding the DQRP club. And um, in the second Sprat, in the spring of '75, the first Sprat came out uh, in um, uh, in the winter of 1974, and then the the second one was in the spring of '75. And G3 uh, George was thanking uh, G uh, EP Essary for his support to the club in shortwave magazine. Uh, in that magazine from 78 to 79, those couple of years, there were about a half dozen one-off articles uh, in shortwave magazine by George uh, Dobbs, G3. And, and then after that, they started an awful lot of serial articles. Remember what I was saying? One-offs are fine, but if you can get them a run of articles that makes people buy a run of issues, they're, that they're, that's a much better uh, commercial option. That's a picture in Shortwave magazine from 1981, uh, which uh, I rather like. I think it's reasonably clear. He, um, he's pictured at his typewriter, mechanical typewriter. No, sorry, it's an electrical, that particular one. And he is preparing his Sprat magazine. And there he is looking all uh, young, uh, long hair, uh, properly washed and combed, etc. You can tell that somebody's been looking after him and keeping him tidy. Uh, and, um, and the beard is all there, but not too, you know, not, hasn't been let to go too wild. Again, you can tell that young Joanne was keeping an eye on him and uh, keeping him on the right path. But it, it's, uh, it's the, he, um, it mentions down below, the, just below the picture, the SC Deluxe that he was writing about that. He had been making a, 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 VF, a VFO. I think I can pick up the actual object itself. Um, this... That's the camera there, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, this is the SC Deluxe VFO. Um, you notice it's in a metal box. 
It's built like a tank. Uh, physically, it's, it's very stable. And uh, that is, um, uh, he, um, the, that, that was, that was what, what had been discovered the hard way, that if you're going to have a, ver a, a variable frequency oscillator, it has to be really stable, and that means physically as well as otherwise. And uh, it just it happens to be that it's handy to look at the actual thing. I have quite a number of George's constructions that I, got, I bought from him when he was uh, downsizing from the vicarage and on other occasions and they're scattered about on this table, and you're very welcome after the talk we'll, to come up and have a look at, uh, at some of them. Also, the books that he published are, are here as well, and um, his various r um, r um, receiver projects and others. Now, um, Right, and, I, and I, the, uh, the shortwave magazine in 1980, I, I've, I'm doing a little bit more detail on shortwave magazine because the only way to get it is that, um, uh, that American website that I mentioned. Uh, Rodcom, you can get to it other ways, and, we, and likewise shortwave magazine, or sorry, uh, practical wireless. Um, in Shortwave Magazine 1980, I had um, projects over six issues of Shortwave Magazine. That's half of them in that year. In, that year. Uh, in January, he started off the SCD Part 1, a low-cost, low-technology amateur band transceiver. SCD was Stephen Christopher Dodd, his son's name. Um, uh, in March, SCD Part 2, April, SCD concluded, and May, and straight into it, the improvement, the SCD Deluxe. It had the Deluxe, had the VFO, instead of a crystal oscillator, uh, and um, I, I only needed to take the surname off the SCD and make it deluxe instead of Dodds. Um, and um, in July and August, parts two and three, and he added on a W3 EDP AMU, and as I said earlier, Stephen Crustor Dodds. So that, that was what he was at in Shortwave Magazine 1980, which remember is 40 odd years ago. That's a, a, a picture of what I've just been able to show you on the camera. 1984-85, uh, he did more kitchen, top te kitchen table technology, was one of his names for a series. And he did kitchen table technology projects in February, March, and April, and, and May. Um, and uh, he did a review of a house uh, uh, direct uh, uh, DC, uh, direct conversion receiver in uh, October, and um, a two meter receiver kit in number six of kitchen table technology series. Uh, Howes at that time was uh, producing as, as a, a, a commercially uh, sets of kits um, for typically for QRP uh, transceivers and so forth and so on. Uh, it's a separate issue, a uh, separate story about the house, and the, uh, the, 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 they, were, they were very interesting uh, and big enough for people with thumbs to be able to do the soldering on. They weren't a QCX <laughs> where uh, you had to do the soldering very fine. Uh, 1985, tinned VMOS. Now, a VMOS is a type of transistor, and he did uh, this was done in a tin. Uh, and that one was done under the tobacco tin, which is a wee bit bigger than, than an Altoid tin. Uh, and, uh, and in February, he did a horizontal article was about the horizontal up. More kitchen table technology, uh, uh, a 14 megahertz transceiver, open wire feeder ideas in August, 
and a transistor tester, which was a kind of audio oscillator type one, in October. 8283, uh, he uh, brought out another, uh, we, that was just when the 10 meter band was, uh, 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 when we got the, uh, the, new, the, new, the new 30 meter band, 10 microcycles, or a bit more than that. They, uh, and they called that little transceiver, he called it Little Ben. And Little Ben was his second son. Have I got that right? Uh, and um, uh, and it, uh, he, uh, this time, the series was going to be called "Plug in your soldering iron and begin here." Uh, and there was eight, there was eight parts to it, July to January 1983. And kitchen, there's still an odd few kitchen table technology ones. Uh, to, uh, put, uh, aimed at putting the amateur into amateur radio. And an example was uh, the uh, NACME foolproof 20 meter transmitter. And at this stage, Joanna, who's sitting down here, was taking, uh, she was doing the black and white photographs at that stage. And there were, there were some very nice photographs of George's constructions. 1986-87, uh, he completed the colon the colon with TRF receiver was, um, uh, it was, I think it was because the person who had made it was going to go to China. <laughs> I can't, I'm not quite sure where the colon came to, came from. Uh, now it was workshop notebook was the name of the series. And uh, he did a low ohms meter, a meter for measuring load. Uh, and he did, um, uh, uh, an 80 meter transceiver, a means of parking his VFO, variable signal sources with toco coils, um, and then along with um, Ian, G3R00, ROO, he did um, uh, G3ROO, uh, is a guy who started off Kanga constructions. And if you take the Kanga and add it on to the suffix first phone call, you can see where the kanga comes from. It completes kangaroo. Uh, a practical, simple MLX transceiver, workshop, uh, an RF changeover system, uh, workshop notebook, more on the, S, on the SCD. And uh, that was also a thing that he would do. Uh, he, would hark, he would hark back to a previous issue, and that again created that continuity that people would eventually go and order the magazine and buy it every month, you know, do some deal like that. In fact, nowadays, the easiest way to get practical wireless and the like is to, is to have a monthly subscription and have it delivered by post. Um, a one valve receiver for nostalgic in May of 87 and a simple ATU. And, and, uh, so you'll see the output was prolific, lots of, and lots of interesting stuff. 88, 891. Right at the first time, this series, and it's a curious little series, they sort of dropped in, uh, and uh, this was in the latter years of Shortwave magazine. And he started right at the beginning again with a crystal set. Uh, and uh, then he added a transformer to it for f uh, and uh, phones. And then he added something that did, uh, uh, one that was more sele sele selective. Then in April and May, that ZN714 it's a little chip that is, 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 a, is a whole a receiver in its own right. Uh, and um, uh, he, the, the, uh, he put an article about making that. Um, and uh, then adding a, an LM386, which is a naughty amplifier chip, to the Z, uh, ZN7141. And then in May, continuing, continuing along the right lines. Uh, uh, the, which is, right, uh, and he um, uh, then soldering, etc. Now we'll pop on, Philip was making signals to me. Uh, just quickly on the USA connection, he, um, he, he, uh, he, he wrote in the QRP Amateur Radio Club International Journal, QRP Quarterly, which is been mentioned earlier, 
he was among the first four elected to the um, uh, to the uh, elected to the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, regenerative receivers was a constant issue. That boyhood bicycle one was it regenerative. He acknowledges in a lot of his work on regenerative receivers, Des Vance, uh, who lives on Ray Island uh, uh, and, uh, on Stanford Loch uh, and uh, in County Down here. Uh, Des Vance, GI3 XZN. I had hoped, I'd hoped to get Des here today, but it uh, worked out it wasn't possible. Des had published a very interesting article in Technical Topics in Radcom. George picked it up and developed it on further in his various um, receivers. Celticon 2000 was in Dublin, and he did, there he used Des's uh, circuits developed to make what he called a stable regenerative receiver. There's a couple of them here on the table to have a look at afterwards. And it had a, a, the receiver and the audio board. And um, the display items are all here to look at. His final column on Radcom uh, was in, two, sorry, in um, 2006. Uh, some CD, other CD, DVD, the regenerative receiver files, simple receivers for anyone, G3R, a compilation to minimalist radio, and the analog experiences, which is based on one of the talks he did. Those are some CDs and DVDs that he published. The sudden was very much his. Um, the sudden receiver had an NE602, um, and uh, they ha oh, sorry. It, I, I don't know how to get back. And, um, A few of his books, and they are here to look at. QRP Basics would be the, base, uh, the best of them, and its third edition uh, is on sale from RSGB. Um, uh, the GQRP Club Handbook, which is taken from Sprit, Sprat, there's a copy of it here to have a wee look at. Uh, the International QRP Collection book, which he wrote with Steve Tetanus Lowe, uh, there's a copy here to look at, and the RSGB, uh, 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 the RSGB handbook that comes out every year, he wrote a really excellent two or th uh, three or four page article about QRP in it, and there's a copy here to have a look at as well if you wish. Now, looking ahead, the future from, the, from now. Hans Summers. And I have, a, I have one of his QCXs here to look at. This is it here. Um, and this little pack. Hans Summers uh, and I met when both of us were fumbling at, 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 at Morse code. And then we met by phone. And he was telling me about having made an 80 meter Va va valve receiver. I says you should bring that up to Richworth uh, and uh, show it to George. And he did. And he arrived in a, a very posh car at St. Aidan's Vicarage, uh, 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 at St. Aidan's Church, parked in Manchester Road. And we all went out and lifted the boot to see this thing. And wrapped in a blanket was this plank of wood with the valves on, a uh, baseboard fashion. And it went and uh, Hans met George, and uh, they got on a house on fire, as the saying is. And he, um, George featured him in the June 2004 Radcom, uh, uh, and um, he set up, Hans set up QRP labs, and um, one can compare the SCD VFO that I was talking about uh, with uh, Hans's QCX 5 watt transmitter. Um, they, uh, and Hans is part of the future. Another part of the future is a speaker later this morning, Nathan Prentice. Uh, he, uh, um, he represents, I hope, the kind of person that is going to be really valuable to us in the future of amateur radio, or QRP amateur radio. 
He did his foundation in intermediate course with me in, Lo in Locker and Amateur Radio Club, and knew far more about it than I did. Uh, a very intelligent young man. He did his full licence with the Bath Club Distant Learning. No better place uh, to do that. Uh, he was been pl playing with Pi in school, where he had an electronics club. And he's a student engineer now in one of those Midulster uh, world-class firms uh, that uh, do things, to, uh, mostly making machinery for the building industry. Uh, and it's the centre of ex world-class excellence in Mid-Ulster. Uh, he's the type of amateur that we need in our future, and he's computing, uh, thinking, computing in with amateur radio. I must mention John Burkett, who had a big part to play at the back of all of this. John Burkett supplied a, a components in Lincoln. His obituary is in Radcom, July. Uh, that surplus shop, uh, a lot of the Kanga kits, all the stuff came from there. A lot of George's projects used uh, John Burkett parts. In fact, John, uh, uh, they became very, very friendly. George married his, you know, his family. We understand his daughter will be continuing that business. It's worth a visit, but don't go on a Wednesday. Don't try to go there. And uh, his Wednesday is his half day. Uh, and, um, but the window is worth peering into. That's how um, even that. Right. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it took so long, Philip. Um, right. And as I said, you're very welcome to come and have a look at some of the things I've talked about here.